Um, you know, like a lot of Americans that watch uh, what's been going on in the news, you know, very concerned and, and uh, you know, uh, started thinking about what could I do to help. And, you know, this has been going on for a long time, this conflict and this uh, refugee crisis. And so for me, at least, the, the big step was going from, you know, I would like to help to let me get involved. People here need a lot more help than well, like, oh, people outside realize. They're not scary, they're not, uh, they don't have any ulterior motive. Like I've asked several patients who we had to deal with, and you, and you ask them, uh, what will you do if the war stopped in Syria tomorrow? A lot of them would say they'd go back home and pack. We, we, we say that uh, our, we are Syrian people killed twice. The first by, by the regime itself, and the second by the silence of the world. There is something weird happened. The silence remained one year, two years, and now we are six years, and still the silence remains. Uh, the kids were thinking that uh, we are going uh, uh, in a picnic. <laughs> uh, my wife, I told her we have to just to move and we will return immediately. It's a matter of one week, uh, two weeks at maximum, and we will return back. And I thought in my mind, it's maybe one month, two months, and uh, we have the change in our country, then we will return back safe, safely. And here we go. <laughs> it's been years now. Um, this is my third trip uh, on a mission with SAMS. This is my second as mission leader. So um, I was in the very first mission that left in March of 2015. So I think we've been thankfully able to expand the number of refugees we're able to serve. SAMS has established a reputation here in Jordan. You know, basically I think what SAMS has done is work to both uh, try and make it as effective as possible for the refugees that are here. So to choose you know, not necessarily a, a, a potpourri of different kinds of specialties, but ones that are in particular demand. Um, but all the patients we see don't have a whole lot of options here. Um, socioeconomically, you know, at the, at the lower levels, it's difficult, no matter what your background. Uh, so, um, you know, we're glad to be able to provide, you know, you know this kind of care. Um, I think all of us going into medical school, I think all of us have this notion of that we want to, you know, become doctors and be able to help out, help out, and, you know, just be able to contribute to the society. I think a lot of us, you know, at least personally speaking, you know, growing up, there was always a lot of trauma around us. I've never personally experienced it, but I've lived around times where there were people that would be, you know, kicked out of their homes at wars, etc. And you always feel like there's, you know, you need to do something. We're all sitting at home safe and sound and you just feel like, you know, you have to do something. Yesterday I saw a few patients and today I saw another two, a few patients that have perhaps chronic illnesses or perhaps don't even realize that their children have chronic illnesses and are getting no medical care for those things. Patients like that in the U.S. or elsewhere in the developed world and even the developing world would be plugged in. You know, they'd, their children, I had a child yesterday with Down syndrome and his mom didn't even know he had Down syndrome. and. I had another child with um, severe developmental delay, you know, lots of medical problems, who wasn't on a single medication. There's just so much need and not enough resources to provide that need. And I think thinking about where they came from and where they are today, you know, these are people who had normal houses and lives in Syria, they may have had a farm, um, and they talk about the sort of the things they had access to in Syria compared to the things they have had access to here, and it's just such a significant and drastic difference. I mean, I think we all have quite cushy lives. <laughs> you know, we've got our apartments and our vehicles, etc. We live a life where we have access to most of the things we need. And it's just remembering these people and trying to help in, in tiny ways, even if it's just raising awareness abroad. You know, we come here, we see some patients, we try to, you know, make a dent in the problem that's here and the, the lack of care that people have. Um, but when you think about what you, what you get back, I mean, um, I got to see firsthand um, the lives that people are living here that we see in the news and we wonder about. And then the other part that I didn't really expect was I got to make a lot of friends, um, you know, like-minded people, very bright minds from around the world. It's such a satisfying feeling 
when you help people. You, you achieve such an inner sense of peace. And I couldn't stop talking about it. I couldn't stop talking about how uh, horrible things were for some patients, how good I felt when they thanked me. Because when they thank you, they thank you like from the bottom of the heart. The issue of, ref issue of uh, refugees has become somewhat politicized. Um, what I can tell you is that um, refugees don't want to be refugees. None of my family ever wanted to leave Syria, and if they could go back to the way it was, they would in an instant. Um, so, I think the, the ultimate solution to this is going to be when we can alleviate what has created the crisis in the first place with respect to the refugees. Um, if we can address their needs, be able to um, give them a sense of safety, give them a sense of hopefulness that they can, you know, move on with their lives.